First thing I wanted to do is announce uh, again, the Jazz Trombone Day um, official announcement of the guest artists for this year will be next week. But in the meantime, we extended the deadline for the Jazz Trombone competition. So that is, we moved it back, back by a week to get people a little bit of extra time. I know it seems like it's really fast and it was only open for a short amount of time, but I had to, uh, we have to get it done so we can find the finalists and book flights and get them to Denton, Texas for November the 20th. So November 20th, 2021 is the Jazz Trombone Day sponsored by Con Selmer and they will be providing a great King Jazz Trombone for the winner. And then the second prize, this is what I wanted to talk about and we'll also be announcing uh, more officially this week, but you're hearing about it already, is we have a custom Dave Butler Butler trombones slide, hand slide, carbon fiber hand slide that he'll make for your horn. So whatever you're playing, he'll make you an outer slide that should fit. So that's going to be super cool. And that'll be for for the second second prize winner. And then our third prize winner, we are working on a prize for the third prize. We'll have three finalists coming to campus. So I'm very excited to have all those extra uh, goodies sorted out here for, for the next uh, trombone day. So that's happening again on November the 20th. So Saturday, 2021. Do you have any favorite composition books. I have uh, the Rimsky Korsakov like principles of orchestration. That one's pretty good. I like the Henry Mancini one. But yeah, the Henry Mancini uh, arranging book is good. I like that too. The Schoenberg thing is like just like too too much. How can I practice not squeezing the mouthpiece? You if you're squeezing it with your hand, you need to just relax your hand. Like what I learned from my teacher, Steve Ture, about holding the horn is that rather than holding the horn with your hand, you kind of use your arm as like, like you use your arm to hold it and your hand is just kind of guiding, right? So it's like, instead of holding, really squeezing, you just kind of use like, no, you can just hold it like this and put the weight so that it goes down here into your arm instead of having to squeeze because it creates so much tension. And so like when I'm holding it, like it's pretty light. I'm just holding it and I'm trying to get a good balance where the the horn is like on balance. I could not let go with my fingers, like it would fall over for sure. The only way you can practice that is practice not squeezing, practice maybe holding your horn a little bit differently and just trying to be relaxed in all things. I think one you know fundamental thing about many, many, many great players is that they look relatively relaxed when they're playing, you know, uh, and it's just flowing. It feels like and looks like it's just kind of flowing out, you know. It maybe isn't, doesn't feel that way on the inside, but on the outside, it's just kind of flowing a bit more. So trying to be as relaxed as possible, I think, is a great way to amplify, you know, your flexibility, your ability to play fast tempos, the ability to express yourself. All those things come from being able to uh, relax. And so any tension you have in your hands and your upper body and your lower body, like it all gets in the way. So Try to just be as relaxed as possible and hold the horn in a relaxed way. What's the story behind the go slow thing behind me? I put this up here because it's literally the most important thing when you're practicing, in my opinion, is that you need to go slow. And if you think you're going slow, you need to go slower. Uh, you probably need to go even slower than you think. Um, this is something I learned just from my time with studying with Steve Ture. Every time I thought I played something slow enough, he'd be like, man, you got to play that slower. It's literally slow so slow that you can think about the change between the notes you do you can think about how you're flowing between the notes you can play them in tune you can play them with a good sound all those different things come into play it's not slow enough so you can never go slow enough basically because the, the slower you get it the more perfect you can not perfect but the better you can get your floor you know like there's like everyone has a ceiling and a floor so you're just trying to get the floor up and up and up so that you're fundamentals and your basics are so good that they carry you through, you know? You ever just transcribe all the solos on a certain recording or maybe at all the trombone solos in a record? Yes, that's something that I do for most of our students in their junior year, if they're doing their undergrad, or at least one semester to take a deep dive onto somebody. Because sometimes we just go a little surface level on this, on this, on this, on this, and we jump around, which is also important because you know you need a little of this and a little of that and a little of this that's really valid and really important to get a lot of different stuff but you also need kind of a deep understanding of a few things and so that happened i think kind of naturally for older generations because there wasn't this like overabundance of just so much stuff on youtube on it you know instagram videos and this and that and people transcribing all different kinds of stuff you got a record and you would sit with the record and so for me that was jj in person you know and i just sat with that record and sat with that record and played it and 
did all of the solos off of there. And that was even a time, a transitioning time where it's like, I bought more CDs, but I just kept listening to that one CD, that JJ in person. We've done, I've done Curtis, I've done JJ. I had a guy do all the solos from the Village Vanguard, live at the Village Vanguard record. Yeah, it's like, it's like a different, different things are important to study, I think, at different points in your life. At some points, you want to do a deep dive and you really want to get inside the mind of that person, that improviser. And then other times you want vocabulary. So you're going to grab from all different places and not even do whole solos. So it's both. You know, you, got, you can approach it both ways. Any good exercises develop a larger range. My go-to range developing exercise is to play tunes in the upper register. You know, play in the upper register because you can do exercises all day long but it doesn't translate to playing music in those extreme registers. You gotta play music. Take a ballad, play it up in half steps until you get up into the upper register and figure out how to make great music in that register. So it's not just about, can I play the notes? It's like, can I make music, you know? That's how I think about the upper register. There's, I mean, there's no, the Norman Bolter, like high range book is, good, is a good one. It's a great go-to, you know? That's something you could check out. I do long tones if I'm trying to like strengthen the upper register, long tones in the upper register. But I've told this story before and I'll tell it again now. So for me, like I was studying with, with Wycliffe Gordon when I was in high school and he showed me some exercises and did different things. And the harder I tried to play in the upper register, the worse it got. And so when I was an undergrad, my probably my junior year, or the end of, between junior and senior year, I was like, you know what? I can't do this, screw this. I'm not playing in the upper register. And as soon as I said that and just like relaxed and just played, the notes that I couldn't hit before started to come out. Now, do I have like the most slamming high register? No. Like, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that just like pastes a high F on the back wall. But that's also it doesn't fit with my musical kind of vision. You know, like that's not what it's about for me. So like to have that was never the goal. Basically it goes back to being relaxed, playing music in the upper register and like just letting go of it. Because as soon as I stopped worrying about it, it started to happen better. Because like you had done all the work, you know, it was just a matter of getting out of your own way and letting it happen. How do you suggest go slow to career though, not just playing? Really the go slow is about going slow enough that you can think about the details, right? So when I think about building a music career, there's a lot of details that you can take care of ahead of time so that you're ready to go when the time is right. Uh, I, I mean, Carl Allen used to say this all the time and lots of other people have said it as well, but he used to say it to us when I was at Juilliard. He always just say, you know, um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So your job is, as a student, as an early career person is to be prepared for the situations. And that means knowing what you need to know to function on a gig, having high expectations of yourself in terms of sight reading, in terms of knowing tunes, in terms of playing different styles within jazz, like playing Donna Lee is not the same as playing some skunk funk, is not the same as playing a wedding band, is not the same as playing in a salsa band, is not the same playing strutting with some barbecue. Like they're all different and they have their own set of responsibilities as the trombone player, different language you need to play to be like in the vibe of the music, you know? You're not gonna play Coltrane changes on strutting with some barbecue and probably get called back. You know, you're not, you're not gonna get, you're not playing the music. Going slow in that case means like being prepared for any musical situation that might come up. And that goes from everything from being musically prepared. There's a certain amount of online presence you need to develop as a musician if you wanna get yourself out in front of people. Not necessarily other musicians, but in terms of other other people that enjoy jazz music, enjoy the type of music you want to play in terms of sharing educational things and getting students and, you know, teaching people something, all of that stuff, you know, there's, there's a method to being able to do that as well. And just taking it one step at a time is an important aspect of it. You know, not getting ahead of yourself, not getting too stressed out as, as just, you know, so I also have this record label, right? This outside of music. And so this, the thing that happens with the artists is a lot of times they just want to go too fast. You know, and they don't take the time to realize that like the first record is like establishing yourself on the scene. Your second record is like following up on the first, establishing your your vibe, your thing, proving that you're like doing your thing, uh, that you have something interesting to say, that you're documenting your journey along the way, that you're thoughtful in the way that you present yourself and your music and all of that stuff and that you're going to show up. Things take a lot of time. I'm really bad at being patient. You know, that's not a strength for me either. And so I've tried my best to try to be more patient, but I'm still working on it too, you know, try to be more patient and 
let things build up on their own. Um, but as a musician, you got to take care of business. You got to take care of all the fundamentals. You got to take care of all the skills you need to have uh, when you need to have them. So, you know, I don't want somebody to not call me back because I wasn't ready. You know, I can, if they don't like how I play, that's fine. But uh, if it's because I wasn't ready, that's not okay for me. Why do you think that most jazz students aren't as fluent with gospel or folk tunes when jazz curriculums are so focused on the music from the 50s to 70s? I think that comes from, you know, a demographic of students that are coming from a different background. They're not always students that are coming up through learning gospel music or hearing gospel music, so obviously they wouldn't know it. It's not a lot of musicians are coming out of the church tradition in one sense. And then I think that that era that you mentioned, like 1947 to 1969-ish, 1968, is kind of like the the golden years of jazz or whatever, like 1959 was supposed to be. But there's always great music from those different eras, even though some of it maybe is a little dated sounding or whatever, but all the guys, all the cats were still out there playing uh, during that that era. But, you know, Winton has done a a job of bringing that stuff back in terms of playing that simpler music. We get in a little bit, I think, as jazz musicians in general, we, a lot of us, myself included, get like kind of caught up in harmony and like going and making things complicated and that kind of thing. And I think going back to playing gospel and folk music is the same as playing pop music now. Like it's simpler, you know, and it's dealing with that simplicity. But, you know, when I was at Juilliard, we played all kinds of stuff. We played that sort of stuff and we played uh, modern music and original music and all different kinds of stuff. So. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a focus, but it's like that with, you know, the Lincoln Center band, too. Like, they play all kinds of things. It's not just old or just new. It's, it's, it's the whole continuum, you know. I don't, so I think that it feels like it's a focus because you're not familiar already. Can you discuss throat tension? Man, so I've had battles with this, too. It started for me when I started, like, working out more. Like, okay, so when I was an undergrad in high school and everything, I was not really focused on my um, health or fitness at all, and then... My grandfather had a stroke and I kind of was like, oh man, like I actually should pay attention to this. And so anyway, I started working out and going to the gym and like eating different and all that kind of stuff. So when I started doing that a lot, I ended up developing a lot of tension in my throat just from like, you know, lifting. You're like, when you're lifting, you can even see it, you know, here you can see the, this, this is tense when I like just make that motion, you know. And so I had to really train myself to start to be able to control muscle exertion whatever like while keeping a relaxed throat because it was translating into my playing where it would like i would just be my throat would be all tight so i just got into like just playing from as relaxed a position as you can i heard steve davis one time talk about um like a baby's breath like taking a breath like a baby like you know just totally relaxed and so just everything being relaxed and just like saying like i was a person that was trying to force everything out and sometime around that same time as the high register thing and all that, like it started to start to like chill out a little bit in terms of just everything kind of coalesced to be like, man, I need to deal with this. I can't get tense here because it causes problems with my air and it causes like air to leak out my nose, which is not a cool, not a good situation. <laughs> For me, it's always trying to stay relaxed. I had problems with this all the way from the beginning of playing because when I started playing like I was only articulating my th throat and it took me like three years for somebody to tell me like hey you need to use your tongue not your throat you know and I was going go 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 like all the time and I couldn't play fast and all that stuff because I was just like using my throat too much. Have you ever had problems with your lips being tired so long from overexertion a couple days before a gig slash project? What would you recommend doing? I think we all get into a, an overuse problem sometimes. Um, what, how it happens to me is I usually get dry and then my chops split and i got this from nadia uh play, we played together in the in the not cohen's tent tent if you take vitamin e and rub it on your chops like take a capsule pop it open and, and use that on your chops it can um, help to really get them more, more moist again so that's how it comes for me but in terms of overexertion and like soreness or swelling that definitely used to happen to me when i played you know maybe like in marching band in high school or something where you're really like playing super loud warm down like if you're not a person that warms down maybe you try warming down Two uh, is practicing in opposites. And I got this from James Burton. He mentioned, I'm, just not, I'm sure he got it from somewhere else, but like he was the first person that said it to me, like, oh, maybe try practicing in opposites. So like if you're playing a lot of loud, when you practice, you want to do uh, soft. If you're playing in the upper register, play in the pedal register. It, it kind of practice opposite from what you're doing a lot and that's causing the overtiredness. The third thing that I would add is whisper tones. 
And I know JJ was an advocate. Well, at least Tere used to say that JJ was an advocate for whisper tones. Um, which whisper tones is like playing from a note down to the point where the note stops or from the air right and holding it at the point where the sound starts right there and hold it really quiet and i think winton does these too but maybe more with scales yeah so you have several plungers on your shelf what have you found is best practice for preparing the mutes and playing with or without a pixie this one i found so this one has no hole in it this one is the one i use with my pixie mute and this one has a hole in it for a while i put a put a penny in this one and I remember Wycliffe was talking about a penny but then no penny and I don't know but so basically I play this one with the the with the hole because it helps with the intonation this one's like a little harder this one is more this is the same plunger I've had since I was in like ninth grade or something you know different plungers kind of have a different strengths and weaknesses um, Tere likes to play like a super hard plunger when he plays with the pixie I use this one and I just use it for everything. In terms of preparing them, you, the main thing is making sure that the pixie goes in far enough so you can close over the, the top of it and making sure the number two thing that happens that I see with students all the time is like they don't play open when it's supposed to be open. Like they'll go closed here and then open is like this far. You know, like they only go that much. Instead of closed, open, open. Get your hand all the way open. So. That's the short answer. But make sure your pixie mute goes all the way in so you can close it and then adjust the tuning slide according, accordingly uh, to make sure you're still in tune. As a horn player, what advice would you give young drummers comping, playing behind a soloist, soloing, etc.? The main thing is like to have a great beat. Like the soloing is great. Comping, like listen to, you know, great players. Like, I don't know. Like to me, it's like the, the drummer is the sound of the band. So you got to think about yourself. Like if I'm hiring you, like it's the sound of the band. You're gonna make the sound of the band. You're gonna direct the band in a certain kind of way. So like you need to have a strong personality and you need to have a strong beat and you need a strong time and you need to push people around and you need to be able to adjust obviously. But if you have a strong beat and the bass player has a super strong beat and you guys don't come together, it's gonna to be like butting heads. You know, people used to tell, I don't know these stories firsthand, but secondhand, I've heard lots of stories about Ray Brown and drummers. Maybe not. Some of them not getting along as well. I, at least when I'm thinking about a drummer, I need somebody that can read music because there's never enough time to rehearse. And sometimes you really have to have charts. Like sometimes you can get away with just playing tunes, but like when you're playing somebody's original music, like sometimes there has to be charts. So like you gotta be a good reader. Uh, in terms of comping, you know, I like a drummer that's gonna push me around. I don't want somebody that's gonna sit around and wait. I want somebody that's gonna like hit it, you know, give me something to play with. Other drummers want somebody to kind of hang out. So you kind of have to suss it out for yourself, but you know, not being too crazy. One of my teachers at Juilliard, Rodney Jones, great guitarist, he used to talk about when Eric Harland was young and he would hire him and it would be just like too crazy and have to like rein him back in. Yeah, man, I mean, it's like a delicate balance of, you know, listen to how the great guys, I always love listening to Roy Haynes and how he inter interacts, you know, and Tony Williams and Elvin and Philly Joe yeah, I mean, there's a Max Roach, like you're the sound of the band and you're a personality. Like I'm not going to hire a drummer. I, I don't, it's like, I need to hire somebody that's got a feel and has got a style and got a vibe, not just drummer. Knowing you're a huge book reader, what's a title or author that you've enjoyed that has helped you reshape how you work on music or productivity? I've been, I've been reading a lot of books that try to get me out of my normal like productivity, productivity, do more, all of that stuff. The four hour work week Tim by Tim Ferriss was an important one to think about, like just re rethinking your relationship to time and value. Your value is not directly linked with time. It's just, and just thinking about like, you're not just trading the hour you show up for a lesson or the hour you show up for a gig. You're trading your value of the years of experience you have to bring, bring it to that hour. Like for example, like, you might be able to play something down on a recording session one time and do it right the first day, the first time rather. And like another guy might take five takes. Well, you've saved that producer so much money by playing it right the first time. You deserve to get paid the same, whether it was five minutes or five hours, you know, like, cause you did it right and that's what they needed. So trying to disassociate that has been a, an interesting battle or an interesting thought. But in terms of productivity, I'm in a phase of trying to do less. I've always done more, 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 more. What does a lazy day look like in the life of Nick Finzer? I'm trying to change that, man. I'm trying to be better about being lazy. It's taken me a long time to slow down and I'm still not. 
I still have a hard time. I don't know, a lazy day? I do some days where I don't do anything. I have a thing like in the back of my head that because I think because I've been doing it so long, like more, more, the more, more, more thing, the go, go, go thing. If I'm not doing something, I have this like low level of anxiety that I'm not doing it. So that creates like a situation where it's like actually stress relieving to do work or to do something or practice or whatever. But what does a lazy day look like? I guess it's doing nothing, taking care of the dog, hanging out. I have synesthesia, so I thought I'd ask, has anyone tried to color your music? There was a guy I went to Juilliard with named Javier Nero, and he, we used to talk about this, because he kind of, I think he has some aspects of that. He, he would tell me a certain, certain chords had certain colors. No one has told me what color my music is. I personally, I don't have synesthesia. If you don't know, synesthesia is where you kind of see colors in music. What are your thoughts on keeping yourself motivated when it comes to study? Like the study of music? Oh man, I've been de thinking about this a lot with some of my students. You gotta find some stuff that you love to play or some stuff that you love to check out and check it out and make sure to go back because like, man, nothing hits you like those things. Like uh, every semester, you know, or every year, I teach, we, we teach for the first year students and, and sometimes other people join the class, but it's mainly for the first year jazz majors. Uh, it's called Jazz Performance Fundamentals. And anyway, like the first couple of classes, we're just like kind of talking and sharing about like what we love about jazz, what we love about trombone, and like sharing the recordings that got me into playing. It was super like inspiring to me just to hear them again. I always play, and sometimes I switch it up, but the last couple of years I've been playing um, uh, Laura, JJ, Laura, and JJ's Mysterioso solo, and like Nat Adderley on there, so killing. I don't know, it brings me back to that discovery. So what I mean to say is like when you're having a hard time, you're feeling burnt out from studying jazz, playing trombone, just play some music you like, you know, and that brings the joy back, and the joy can help you to fight through the hard times, you know, fight through the stuff that's like not inspiring, you know. Let's start wrapping it up for the day. But again, we've got a week and a day left to submit for the UNT Con Selmer Jazz Trombone Day. Uh, so I hope you'll submit for that. It's totally free. You don't got to pay anything. Totally free. You can win some trombones, some uh, custom carbon fiber hand slide. Uh, and, and the other things, one more one more thing coming up. I, can, I can't announce it yet. So I hope you have a fantastic evening or morning or wherever you are. And uh, we'll be back next week. So thanks a lot. And uh, I'll catch you all soon.